When someone begins to question their faith, the last thing church leaders want to do is say the wrong thing or handle it in a way that will further push them away. With so many historical concerns or doctrinal questions, what is a leader supposed to do? I'm happy to report that Leading Saints is here to help with the Questioning Saints Library. This is a full library of 20 plus presentations related to how to minister to an individual who is questioning their faith. We cover topics like how to answer tough questions, maintaining your relationships when someone leaves the church, and how to embrace doctrinal ambiguity. If you want to review all the sessions from the Questioning Saints Library at no cost for 14 days, simply go to leadingsaints.org 14. That's leadingsaints.org slash one four. While you're at it, we'll give you access to all of our virtual libraries that cover several leadership related topics. So click the link in the show notes or simply visit leadingsaints.org slash 14. Let's go around the room, do some introductions. I'll start. So my name is Kurt Frankham. I am the executive director of Leading Saints, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And we are dedicated, you know, have a mission here to help Latter-day Saints be better prepared to lead. Now, me personally, I live uh, in Stansbury Park, Utah, which is in Tooele County. I grew up in West Valley City and I've been running Leading Saints really since 2010 when it started out as a hobby blog. 2014 is when the podcast started and now we are over 10 million downloads. And uh, man, we're glad that you are now one of those downloads. Let's jump in. Today, I'm in Green Bay, Wisconsin, sitting down with Ben Saborin. Welcome to the podcast, Ben. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is cool to, to do some of this in person while I'm in town yeah. and, and get these recorded. So yeah. uh, now you, uh, you originally from Green Bay? No, I grew up on the East Coast, Rhode Island. That's where I was born and raised, lived there wow. till I was 13. People really live in Rhode Island. They huh? do. It's the smallest <laughs> state in the union. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I lived there. Uh, my parents were both converts and uh, my mom joined um, got tracked into by some missionaries when I was, I believe, five or six. Um, met my stepdad. He later joined the church as well and got baptized. And we did the whole temple and got sealed in 1978 with my parents wow. in, uh, in Washington, D.C. And um, so then we moved out to Wisconsin when I was uh, just before my freshman year of high school. So I've lived a lot of different places. Okay. So I kind of. Was it here in Green Bay? Or? No, we lived way up north. We uh, went to we went from a ward in was in Rhode Island to the third family in a branch up in Ashland, Wisconsin. Wow. That meant at the local college in the college rooms on Sunday. Nice. And had the uh, tape cassette recorder for the music. And uh, you spoke every month because there wasn't too many people to speak. Um, you bore your testimony every month because there was only 15 people in the room. Um, I was the only young man till I was 16 years old. And then a 12 year old came in. Oh, wow. Who, you know, wasn't my brother, which was good. But uh, so, yeah, it was a definitely a unique opportunity to learn um, what life is like. in a, I call it a micro branch. Yeah. It's not even a branch. For it's sure. a micro branch. Yeah. The closest stake center was uh, Duluth, Minnesota, which was roughly an hour and a half away. Um, but I had great young men leaders back then who would because we did back in those days super saturdays uh -huh, yeah where we and our stake was all the way into the iron range of minnesota so the farthest away unit from our little branch we were the only branch in wisconsin that was part of the duluth stake the farthest one was way up north and i believe it was seven hours one way <coughs> to get wow. there so but i had great leaders because we would do super saturdays once a month and they would drive me at least to duluth to hop a ride with the bigger unit the the to go and do my opportunity to have an experience to meet people who were other members of the church because i yeah. went from a nice 
you know, large ward because it was basically everyone in Wisconsin or everyone in Rhode Island went to that one church in Rhode Island um, and uh, to like a micro branch, 15 yeah. people. Wow. But the funny thing is, is I always joke, you know, because when you're when you live in the mission field, as I always have, um, you uh, you know, everyone's from Utah who's a missionary, uh-huh. Uh-huh. you know. And so when I got time to put my paperwork in, I was so excited because when I would go on my mission, I wasn't going to be a Utah missionary. I could say I'm from Wisconsin. Uh-huh. Um, and at the time we were living in upper Michigan. So in the UP up in Marquette. So I could say I, could be, I was from the Michigan missionary you know, in Wisconsin. And uh, halfway through my paperwork, my parents decided to move to Utah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so they moved to Huntsville, the home of David O. McKay. Uh-huh. And so I lived. Uh, so I finished my missionary paperwork and actually left from the Huntsville first ward in oh, Utah. Wow. Nice. So, you know, the Lord always has a way of helping me be humble. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So did you still say you're from Wisconsin? No, absolutely not. I, I was from a Utah. I'm a Utah yeah. missionary. So nice. that that's nice. where my home ward was at the time. And, yeah. you know, I, I did the whole story if, you know, if it lended itself the opportunity of explaining, you know, six months before I left for my mission, I was in, you know, not in Utah, but yeah. that was my home ward. Yeah. You know, so it was what it was. Any idea how that micro branch is doing now? Or? So, yeah, absolutely. My, I still have a brother that lives up there. Um, and until my parents lived up there, up until uh, five years ago to when they retired down to Houston area. But yeah, they are in a two stage building, Hmm. Um, still a branch, you know, it's a small town of 8,000 people. So it's still a branch. Um, But yeah, they probably have active, you know, 30 to 45 people every Sunday. And, you know, it's a nice little strong branch with a two stage. So they have that little cultural hall, just enough for them. And um, they've maintained, uh, you know, there's some legacy people there from when I was there still. And <laughs> some of their children now live in the area. But, you know, like like a lot of small towns, the economic opportunities are are very unique yeah. and small. You know, unless you work for the college or the university extension or the school system, you know, or own the state farm. Yeah. You know, it's <laughs> you're working at Walmart pretty yeah. much, you know, because all, all the old because he was a big ore mining town and all that's kind of dried up. You know, so, yeah. So, yeah. So it went on your mission to went on my mission uh, to the Dominican Republic was nice. originally assigned to the Santo Domingo mission um, a year into my mission. I had the unique opportunity where uh, they knew they were dividing the mission at some point. So half of our class actually were zone leaders day one. Oh, really? So while I was in training, I was with a zone leader. So I was, you know, and so it was a unique opportunity to kind of see. I, I always say there's different stages of missionary work. And when you're a zone leader, you kind of see how the sausage is made. Uh-huh. And so it was a unique opportunity to learn to be a missionary while at the same time seeing the administrative side of the mission. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, it was there was four of us total that were with zone leaders. And uh, so we did that through our training. And then uh, a year in, they divided our mission in half. And so there was a Santo Domingo West and Santo Domingo East mission. Um, uh, and so, yeah, so that so I never was a zone leader again after that. Mm-hmm. But I was you got the opportunity to try trained a lot, which mm-hmm. I loved. I Training was my favorite thing on the mission because mm-hmm. it was just the opportunity to um, help people see the opportunities they could learn if they just embraced. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's always the key. You got to embrace. Nice. And then um, you come from your mission and and during the next decade or so, you went went through some really intense it less inactivity. I don't know yep. what we're, yep. we're supposed so, to call it now, but yeah. I, yeah. It's always, it's kind of like we talk with missionaries. Don't call them investigators anymore. Right. They're like, friends. And it's like, <laughs> mm. <laughs> right, so, yeah. the, you know, the ch- changing of the words gospel is still true. Yep. Um, so yeah, so I came home, uh, got married. i um, actually married a girl from my mission. Um, we were like married. A, a, a Dominican. Yeah, okay. yep, absolutely. Actually, after my mission, I actually came home early for back surgery. So I served 18 months, came home on medical, um, had reconstructive back surgery, which was wow. unpleasantly pleasant. You, so unique side story. Okay. Okay. So I went um, to go get my patriarchal blessing before my mission. It was in Huntsville. Um, went to the patriarch's house, waited, waited, no showed. The patriarch no showed. Patriarch no showed. At his house? At his house. <laughs> like are you in his living room? I'm just, no, there? I'm sitting in his driveway. Oh, okay. There's no one's okay. there. And so what happened? Medical emergency. We find out later because, you know, back okay. then, you have to remember, it's 1990. So there's no texting. Right. There's no cell phones, yeah. you know. So you're just sitting there, you know. That's you, what we did. There's no pay phones, you know. It's such a different world. So he had a medical emergency. So he had a medical emergency. So I didn't even know about it. 
I left because I, I was getting my paratracheal blessing three days before my I was to leave to, to report to the MTC. Oh, my goodness. Because this is also back in the 90s where typically you didn't get your patriarchal blessing until you were ready to go on your mission. Yeah. yeah. Or go off to college. Yeah. Where now it's a little different. You know, kids get a much young or can have the opportunity to get a much younger if they're if they're if they're ready. You know, if their parents feel they're ready. Anyway, so I go to the MTC. Well, there's a patriarch assigned to the MTC, of course. Mm-hmm. So we set up an appointment. I go and wait. <laughs> and wait no way no showed what no, medical what? emergency really he was also in the hospital oh my goodness so the the mission president at the mtc looked at me and said uh maybe you're not supposed to get it so i go on my mission mission president says you know first thing you the mission home you know get the whole read your patriarchal blessing and uh-huh. so he finds out in the interview i don't have one and he says well there must be a reason so i hear that twice now from two mission presidents so i i do my whole mission come home have you know extensive back surgery uh and come to find out through this whole situation i was born with a birth defect in your back in my back where my lower spine that bottom vertebrae that connects to your pelvis doesn't it didn't exist it would never formed oh wow so it's very common that's a doctor told me it was very common and by this time when i came home i didn't come home to utah i came home to pocatello idaho because my parents had moved off oh, on wow. my mission Oh my so I had a really great doctor. He was uh, one of the doctors that would work on general authorities out of, out of Pocatello. So super great doctor. Um, but it, typically you find out about my issue. You would find out about it when you're in your sixties and seventies, when your muscles start to deteriorate or lose mm-hmm. their elasticity. But it happened when I was younger, which was the blessing was, you know, I come from humble beginnings. I'm the oldest of 13 children. Oh, wow. So, you know, uh, the church, cause I was still a missionary covered all the medical bills. So wow. and it was $90,000 in 1992 money. Wow. So it was, it was, yeah, it yeah, was yeah. significant 12 hours. So anyways, so I got, I'm, I'm in recovery and I'm like, well, maybe I should go get my picture on Google. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if the third time is the charm. So I set it up. I do the whole thing. And the, my picture on blessing after you go through the initial, you know, introduction part, the first part of the blessing starts. It was your lot in life to be afflicted with this ailment huh. that has stopped your mission. Wow. And so I like words, words and definitions of words. So the joke I always like to have is we're sitting up in the pre-existence, me and my friends, angel comes up, hands us lots. Hope puts his hand out with lots uh-huh. and I pick the short straw. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the nice part about the blessing also reminds me or tells me that any work that was left undone will be done. Mm-hmm. So then fast forward 30 years later, my daughter gets her call for her mission. Where does she get called to? The exact same mission I served in. Wow, Dominican cool. Republic East Mission. So she never served in the same area I did, but there were six months I left undone. So she could have served in areas that I was going to, but didn't yeah. to help finish that work. So oh, it was cool. it was nice. Cause so so yeah, so back to the other back to the main story. So got divorced. Uh, divorce really kind of rocked my world, you know, um, and uh, was the, you know, and that really kind of put me in a position of, you know, I did the whole, I did everything right. And, mm-hmm. you know, didn't work out, didn't work yeah. out, you know, curse, you know, curse yeah. people and kind of did the whole why God and then decided I, I, I made the uh, inaccurate choice, but it seemed accurate at the time and logical of I have tons of friends who aren't members who are happy and are doing everything in the sun. Well, let's go try that for a while. Uh-huh. And um, so, yeah, so I spent 14 years inactive um, and, you know, did a lot of things, um, you know, it was civic with civic organizations, um, had opportunities to serve in leadership roles. Um, and that was that kind of became my religion almost mm-hmm. where I would volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. Um, and I was part of Junior Chamber International, which is an international leadership development organization. Um, served as local chapter president here in Green Bay, um, served as in a state office, state president, international vice president to Europe, wow. national president or national vice president in the United States. And that really became what I focused on and filled that void that church service would have filled. Yeah. And did you ever feel like, I mean, was there time you didn't were intellectually you didn't believe or Never. did you always believe always but, believed but so did when, you think you'd always you'd come back at some point i did yeah. I, I, and, and so i have mastered the art of procrastination 
<laughs> and so, you know, so my wife now, Cindy, um, we've been married, we'll be married 23 years this year. Um, and so when we got married, we got married in her little church up in the upper peninsula of Michigan, her hometown church. But when we got married, I wanted to, I, I, I for me, I needed to make sure that I wasn't, that the marriage was not making me a member of that church. Okay. That was like, even though I was not active uh-huh. and for, she was not a member, she was, she's not, she was not a member at the time. And, um, she was, but grew up Christian, you grew up a Methodist mm-hmm. mom and dad were they're heavily involved in their church, went to Bible camp. You know, she was a camp counselor. So she was very religious as well, had a very strong faith and belief in God. Um, but just different faiths, yeah. you know? Um, and so, and so we got married there and we, and the funny thing is we great marriage. Like I said, we married 23 years. Um, but for many years, the only thing we wouldn't talk about was religion. Hmm. Did just, it just go you went bad or no, no, not bad. It's just, I had my belief. She, we both believed in God and we agreed that's where we needed to keep it. Uh-huh. But the other stuff, you know, preexistence, word of wisdom, that kind of stuff was like, meh. Uh-huh. You know, eh. so we just didn't go deep into religion beyond belief in God. And nor were you necessarily living deep no, into religion. I, exactly. So it, wasn't it, was, it, was, yeah. it was great. You know, it, it worked. Was, <laughs> at, at, right. It worked for the time, uh-huh. you know. Um, but then there came a time. So about so there, there was my, my ex-wife was getting remarried and, and my daughter was in her early teens and um, she was struggling, you know, trying to find her own way. And uh, the relationship wasn't that good between her and her future stepdad. So my ex-wife called and asked if I would take full custody. Um, and I was like, absolutely, you know, absolutely. And so we did that. And so that's when I had to choose. So two years prior to that. Um, so through my life, I've kind of, as I look back, I, I see how the Lord works in my life mm-hmm. and it's either through, he gives me opportunities to change before he humbles me, you nice. know? Nice. And so that's what I've identified. So I, as I've gotten older, I've realized that if I make the right choice ahead of time, the humbling never has to happen. <laughs> yeah. So I, um, and sometimes the humble and, and some, you know, much like with repentance, humbling isn't always negative. You know, sometimes the humbling is, is not a negative experience, but it's a, you know, here I am, see my hand because mm-hmm. I'm showing it to you now. Mm-hmm. You know, I've, I've tried to nudge and you've just not paid attention. Um, so yeah, so I, um, I, uh, so two years prior to getting that call from my ex-wife, I um, felt that I need to kind of come back to church and get myself right. Mm-hmm. Just kind of that yearning, that little in your gut, you're like, okay, you've, you've had this time and you've, you know, the prodigal sunned it. And cause during this time also, I spent many years where I didn't speak to my family. Wow. Just because, you know, um, my mom, I'm the oldest. And so it's that sense of disappointment, you yeah. know, where you're the oldest, you're supposed to set the example. And so I just didn't, I just was like not comfortable in that space. Um, so yeah, so I, so I, uh, so for years, for two years prior, I was like, oh man, I really should. But how do I broach that with my wife? Yeah, I was going to ask that, right? How do I broach it? Well, unbeknownst to me, my wife had been feeling the same thing. Hmm. That what we were missing in our relationship was Christ, a religion. So she was having those feelings. But again, we didn't talk about it. Mm-hmm. We talked about everything. So that, that never connected. So I've always, the funny thing is, is I've always lived in Green Bay, probably within three miles of the chapel here on the east side of Green Bay. Uh, anyways, so the missionaries, we had a member that lived, older couple member that lived in our new house, uh, like right two houses from a new house we bought. We had no idea. Mm-hmm. So in 2010, we had bought our house. And, um, you know, with a house, you have to buy and get a dog, you know. <laughs> so we, we got a little teddy bear dog. And so um, my wife was out in the yard one day. And the sister missionaries were tracting in the neighborhood. And so they came in and we had had the missionaries over before, you know, elders. But the interesting thing was always the elders would approach me and not her as the inactive or as approach me as the inactive and not her as the potential new. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so she'd be like, nah, they're not interested in me. I'm going to go do something else, you know? So we'd have them over for dinner occasionally. And, but anyways, so they came up to her and my wife, cause, cause also side story, we had communicated now uh, two years after we had both been feeling this, we had gotten to the point where we said, Hey, you know, I'm kind of feeling like this. And she, my wife says, yeah, I'm kind of feeling I'm missing Christ in my life too. Mm-hmm. So we had had that conversation about 
a week or two before the sister missionaries stopped and talked to my wife. So my wife thought I had called them to come by because my wife has worked uh, remotely for about 12 years. Um, so she's home working. So, so anyway, so the sister, so my wife invited the sister missionaries over and, uh, that's how it started. Hmm. My wife started taking the discussions and I never thought that would happen. So she started taking the discussions in 2012, got baptized January, 2013. Wow. And at that point you're, you're uh, back, right? Like you're- well, by then I was back because yeah, cause we got, our, my daughter came and live with us the summer of 2012. And she started her freshman year of high school, uh, September of 2012. And that's when I made my choice. I had to go back. And I told my wife, I said, look, I said, here's some things we got to understand about our faith. If I'm going back, I'm not going back half. Because mm-hmm. I did the half. Yeah. You know, I grew up in the mission field. It's easy to do the half where you, you know, kind of live you know, skating between the lines Monday through Friday, but just you're worthy just enough to bless the sacrament on, you know, sa- on Sunday, uh-huh. you know? So uh-huh. I did the half. I said, but I'm old enough now where I need to go in all in. I need to. And I said, you know, we need to, I just need you to understand that that means callings. And I said, this is the one thing I've dreaded because I was always selfish with my time, you know? Mm. But I, but then I said to myself, I spent so many years volunteering in this civic organization. It's no different. Mm-hmm. It's the same amount of time, mm-hmm. it's less travel. So, yep. So I went back full force, did the whole, met with the bishop, you know, did the whole thing, you mm-hmm. know. Um, and then uh, six months, uh, my first calling three months in was assistant ward clerk. And I'm like, okay, we had a great ward clerk at the time. So I really didn't have to do him much. I just would sit and observe. And when he was on vacation, I would kind of take in or help with the audit. And then three months after that, I get a call from the stake president. Can you come see me? And I'm like, well, this is never good. Yeah. You know, it's going to the principal's office, you know, yeah. the superintendent's office. So he pu- I came in and met with him and my, and my wife at the time wasn't even a member yet. She was, she had her baptism date. Uh-huh. And he looked at both of us and said, Lord's called you to be Ellis Corn president. Wow. And I went, okay. Here's that calling. Here's that calling. And it's not just, it's not just teaching primary or young men or young women. It's Ellis Corn president. Mm -hmm. It's you are responsible for the men, for the elders in your ward. And so I looked at him and I said, um, president Crable, I said, you know, that, uh, I haven't been active. You know, I'm active now, but I'm only six months in and I'm still trying to remember how to pray. Mm-hmm. not to remember to pray, but how to pray mm-hmm. other than the, you know, I'm trying to remember how to read my scriptures again. You know, I'm trying to do these things for me. So I'm ready. And, uh, he said, yeah, I know you'll do fine. Nice. The, the Lord's called you. Yeah. And so again, what I've realized for me, because of my nature, you know, my favorite scripture is Mosiah three nineteen. It's kind of like my, my, I call it my lighthouse scripture because I'm very keen on the, who I am as a natural man. And I always have to remember That's like one of the scriptures I keep in my mind that I can recite at least the first part, which is the most important part. Natural man is an enemy to God. So I know if I'm doing natural tendencies, I'm not doing what God wants me to do. Mm. I I'm in direct conflict with him. Um, so yeah, so I, the Lord knows that for me, the best way I learn is hands-on. And so by having to lead a quorum, um, it forced me to be uh, a better disciple of Jesus Christ faster Yeah. than otherwise a, a, another calling would have because I had to do PPIs. Mm-hmm. I had to counsel <clears throat> with counselors. Mm-hmm. I had to lean on the keys that were given to me to find out what would be best to activate react, you know, people who were just like me six, who I was six months ago, I had to now go and meet with. And so I think for, for me, that really helped me see them where they are. So I think that's one thing I've learned over my, you know, as a missionary. And then now um, today through my gospel journey and my life journey is you know, I try to see people for where they are or meet them where they are um, to help them become who the Lord needs them to become or not necessarily needs them, but who they're supposed to become. 
you know, because sometimes I, I know like in myself, I didn't know who I could become because I'm my own worst critic. Hmm. But the Lord knew the stake president listened and he knew the bishop agreed to give me that, you know, to extend that calling to me to help me learn who I could be. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, so tell me in that as you started that calling as the elder Corn president, you know, with that, you know, with that background and whatnot, was it, what dynamics come to mind or how did you handle it? Was there a benefit of having you in that, in that role? And, and what comes to mind? Yeah, I think for me, um, it really was, I had to, I had to believe in the atonement. I had to believe that I was worthy hmm. to stand in front of men who were giants in my mind. Yeah. You know, who were past bishops, Pat, you know, I had to, I had to believe that they didn't look at me as less um, because of my trials or because of my journey. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, and that took time. Now, one thing is I, um, an interesting, you know, people always find this sometimes shocking who know me is I'm an introvert by nature. Um, I, I'm not an extrovert, mm -hmm. you know, and, and how I define that is, is I don't, I don't, um, to revitalize and kind of like re-energize myself. I just need myself, mm -hmm. solitude, peace, quiet. I don't need people to get, you know, where my wife is the opposite. She's a people, you know, she loves to be with people because that kind of gets her, gets her going and gets her revitalized. So I had to learn, but I've never been afraid to public speak, which was also a benefit because I learned that mm. during my years in, as, a, as a leader in junior chamber. Oh, nice. So those 14 years, I'm standing in France in front of a hundred local chapter presidents doing a 45 minute speech on a stage with a, like almost like a Ted talk. Yeah. So I, so, but what I had to learn was I had to be comfortable in not knowing gospel principles. And that's a hard thing. I think sometimes for, for me, it was because you want to know the answer and you don't always know the answer. And I was, one of my fears was saying something wrong and being corrected, like getting a gospel principle wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, so, at, but then that caused me to do what? Study. Study. Right? Yeah. You know, I mean, so it's the cause, you know, um, and, and I also think having my background allowed me to be empathetic more, I think. Hmm. Um, not that I would ever encourage people to spend 14 years yeah. inactive and go through the repentance yeah. process with your bishop. Um, but for me, it allowed me to, I could sit in a room with a, with a, with a man who is struggling and absolutely relate and understand. Yeah. And so that helped me because it helped me, again, see them as Christ would, you know, see the man for who he is and not the actions that he's doing. Yeah. And I thought that would, that was powerful for me because it helped me. Um, it's almost like as you grow older, you kind of understand the relationship between heavenly father. Once you have children, mm -hmm. You know, when they disappoint you, you understand how, you know, when they do something, you're like, oh, I wish you would have made that choice. Mm -hmm. You know, then I kind of realize, oh, that's kind of how probably Heavenly Father feels when I make a silly choice, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so it was, so yeah, so it was definitely, my journey was definitely beneficial on one side because it allowed me to have experiences and empathize and, and understand and speak with that understanding. Um, but it also caused me to have to do some work. You know, I couldn't just say, Hey, I'm a seminary graduate graduate, which I did. I graduated seminary, but you know, I, I didn't, you know, da, 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 you know, yeah. never strayed all these fun things. And I've read the scriptures every day, the rest of my life, my whole life. And I can have things memorized. And yeah. um, I didn't have that. You know, I had the ABCs of the gospel. Yeah. And I appreciate that, that, um, and whether that comes from the elders quorum president, maybe has had that journey or, a, you know, a, a atypical uh, course, but for even a elders quorum president or, or a leader to make sure that those individuals know that there's others in the quorum with it, not that they would, you know, obviously with permission and, and whatnot, but Absolutely. encourage that, you know, let's yeah. share our stories so that we all know that life's been tough for many of us, if not all of us. And uh, that builds unity. You know, and that's really, uh, that's a great point. Cause that's one of the things I, I don't know. Okay. So I, I'm very direct as a natural person. All right. <laughs> so I'm going to try to be, let's do it. I'm going to try to be direct, but not offend. Um, so I think sometimes we are so siloed as members of the church mm -hmm. and we guard so closely our struggles 
that we drowned in them. Mm. Yeah, that's true. That we, especially men, you know, as I was Elders Quorum president, I was like, we don't, we don't talk about anything of substance other than are you doing the fantasy football this in the ward right or, you know we, we don't we don't talk about our struggles and our we don't even admit that we struggle sometimes i felt i felt when i was yeah. old scorn president and that's not healthy you know i was there i always say that i was jealous of the relief society because they could sit and cry in, in their in their lessons and get <laughs> feelings out and, and have I always felt they could have real discussions sometimes mm. um, where men were we tend to be guarded. You know, uh, we tend to be that strong. You know, we want to p- p- present that strong face of, you know, strength. And, uh, you know, I'm a strong priesthood holder and I don't have weaknesses. And um, and, and it's and it's a lie. Yeah. We all do. Yeah. And so what I tried to do, one of the things that for me in my tenure as elders quorum president, service became paramount in my time where, you know, whether it was raking leaves in the fall, whether, I mean, it, and it was, I, my quote was always, we're, we're, we're not just movers. You know, we would replace roofs. We would do hot water heaters. We would, cause we had so many talents. And that was the other thing is we didn't know each other. Hmm. So I didn't know you that this member could fix a car and had a whole literal garage at his house. Mm-hmm. I didn't know this member. I mean, I knew I, 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 I didn't know in the beginning, but then I made sure we found out. Right. We had a member who had a whole wood shop in his basement, like a legit high school wood shop. Yeah. Wow. And he was a ma- master of all trades. And he, all you had to do is tell him there was something going on and he would come and teach the younger men in the elders quorum. Uh-huh. And he was a high priest at the time. This is when we were, we were yeah. separated yeah, yeah. back in the day. Um, so for me, service became the way that we built a bridge to unity. Because you're not thinking about yourself. You let your guard down. You become vulnerable. Yes. You know, and um, the other thing is we didn't meet. We didn't have socials. So I was like, I'm done with this. We ha- we got to be friends more than just for the hour we're at church yeah. and explain p- pleasantries. And now it's every other week. Right, exactly. Yeah. So it's even less. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I said to myself, what can men get around? What what do we all like as men? You know, men, you know, Tim, <laughs> Tim Allen. <"Mur." laughs> Meat, a grill. We love eating. Yeah. We love cooking outside, you know, over a fire, you know? So I did the, I, I did a social called men meet and meet <laughs> three M's. Men meet a, and meet. Yeah. We made a little flyer and we, we just did it for one year. It was, I think in my second year as old corn president, maybe even by my like first year. Like an annual type thing? We did it every other month. Oh, we really? We wow. Okay. Or every quarter. Sorry. Every quarter, every three months we did it. And the first one we did, we had 32 elders. We were getting on average 15 at a meeting on Sunday. Really? We had 32. And everyone, it was kind of like we did a potluck. Everyone smoke something and bring it or cook some meat and bring it. Uh-huh. So you had all these different varieties. We did it at my house, not at church. That's always, that was always my big thing. Socials don't belong at church. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Unless it's like the church Christmas party or whatever. Yeah. But it does shift that dynamic. It does because some home. people are like, oh, should I come dressed up more formal? Cause I'm going to church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, come to my house. Yeah. I open my home, you know? And so we did it at our house. The next one we did the fa- next, next quarter, we had 28. So we had less, but so what? We had 28. Mm-hmm. You're never going to get everybody. Right. So we did that in the beginning. And, and, and I learned quickly cause the second one I made homemade brats from scratch Really? Wow. And I learned buying them is much better <laughs> because the amount of time it took to make 32 brats was not, the ROI okay. was not there. <laughs> so they tasted good. Oh, but, they were phenomenal. Oh yeah. But it took but, forever and it was a 10 yeah, bucks a, yeah, a brat. <laughs> literally. Yeah. With my time was probably more like 25. Yeah. It was just, <laughs> but again, it's the experience. And I love to cook, but it was the experience of teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Learning together. We had the, we had uh, NCAA, I think it was NCAA. We had some, cha- some championship game on, you know, uh, or it could have been NBA finals. And so we're watching it on the big screen in my living room. And so everyone's there, you know, we're all joking. And through that, we built a unity mm-hmm. to where, you know, we became vulnerable, which is what we need. Um, one of the things I always, as we change from ministry, from home teaching to ministry, you know, I found it so, and I was the eldest quorum president when this happened. I found it so, so 
puzzling how so s- people struggled with it. Hmm. And and I and I and I as I just observed and kind of just sat back, I was like, man, do we have to have another lesson on how to minister? I mean, we've been home teaching since the dawn of man, yeah. you know, since recorded history, you know. <laughs> and I think what I what I came up with is ministering requires you to open yourself up. Yeah. Ministering requires vulnerability. Ministering requires love. You know, it requires you to think of someone other than yourself. And that's hard for people. It's easier to have. I know I got to give this lesson because it's first pregnancy lesson. I always show up the last Sunday of the month. They know it. I know it, you know, and it's just a, it becomes a ritual, you know, just something we always do. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and now with ministering, it's almost like a choose your own adventure, right? <laughs> you know, how you do it is, is, but it needs to be based on the needs of those you're assigned to. Right. And I always, I always remind people that if you listen to any talk that talked about home teaching, like as a, and they gave you an example of the pillar of home teaching, it wasn't home teaching. It was ministry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? And so, um, so I think as we did that, you know, as we opened our hearts and, 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 and love to serve each other, um, it became, we became closer as a group. Yeah. You know, we could see people's body language on a Sunday or see their, how they just kind of carry themselves. And we knew something was wrong as a presidency. Mm-hmm. And so we'd pull them aside and just say, hey, is everything okay? Yeah. You know, I'm always a big fan of not waiting for someone to ask for a blessing. Hmm. Just ask them, huh? Correct. Yeah. Because I, th- again, as men, we have the tendency to be like, ah, I'm fine. Yeah. It's all, and, and as also as men and as people, we don't have a tendency to ask open-ended questions because we don't want to know. <laughs> because what are we going to do with it? Like, right. what if, what just, if, it's yeah. like, I, I want to, my empathy, you know, most people haven't, it, it, they're empathetic to the point where you start explaining and then they're like, I'm good. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> like, I don't really necessarily want right. to hold on to this. Because so. if you, if, it, yeah. if I hold on to it, now I'm responsible yeah. for it. And right. I'm like, I want a level of responsibility, but not that much. Yeah. And so I think, so for me, we, we would watch body language and we would, and even now, you know, I have a couple friends that I, I'm not assigned to minister to, but I just love talking with them and, you know, and I really kind of have a kindred with them, even though our age ranges are really different. And I'll watch them. And if I see they're off, mm-hmm. I pull them aside. Even And, and now with my calling currently. Um, You're on the high council. Yeah, right? I'm on the high council now. Um, so just the church is true. Figure that trajectory. The, the <laughs> atonement works for everybody. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I don't get to go to my ward as often as I used to. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, I have, third Sunday I'm speaking somewhere else. And then I'm assigned to the Spanish branch. And so they meet in the same building as the Green Bay First Ward does, but on different times. So they conflict. So I'm only usually in my ward once a month now. And so I don't get to see people I like to see as much as I, you know, that I, that I kind of like, kind of just kind of watch for. But I, you know, recently I had a situation where one of the guys that I, that I really love, he just was going through some stuff and we talked in, in the hallway. And I just looked at him and said, you know, blessing. And he's like, nah, I'm good. Hmm. And so we bro hugged it out. <laughs> I went to my, my, you know, my assignment, I went to Ellis Corman Spanish branch and, and, uh, get home and I'm making dinner. Cause we do Sunday dinner, kind of like on blue bloods, all the kids, all my kids live in green Bay, uh-huh. my adult kids. And we do the family dinner on Sunday. And, uh, and I get a text as I'm making dinner. Can you come over and give me a blessing? Oh, wow. You know, that's cool. And so I think, I think sometimes we, you know, I I love the talk by Elder Uvdorf, love, share, invite. Mm -hmm. It is such a beautiful principle when you think about it. Um, Because people don't care unless they know how much you care. Mm -hmm. And so if you love people and then you share a little bit of yourself with them and then you just invite, whether they accept it, it's not your problem. Yeah. Yeah, that's powerful. I love that. I mean, there's so many, 
so many principles there. Yeah. Right? It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's one of those principles. Like on my mission, I learned that. Yeah. I learned, I learned the principle of love the people. Yeah. You know, I always prided myself on my language ability. Um, it's one of my talents. I think that God gave me is my ability to absorb languages and not speak like a gringo when I speak Spanish. Um, <laughs> And even all these years I've kept it up and the whole nine yards. And um, I learned on my mission as I observed and I trained and worked with other missionaries, those who learned to love the people and not judge them were the ones who learned the language faster, were the ones who um, were accepted mm -hmm. as, you know, because when you go into a different culture, you got to be accepted. Yeah. You know, I was having a discussion yesterday at Sunday with uh, our uh, first council in our state presidency, President Nishimoto, because he's part of Oneida, which is the Native American war. Yeah, I, I did an interview yeah. with him. So, yeah, I love him to death. He's awesome. Um, but we talked a little bit about culture, you know, and I said, you know, when you go into a Hispanic culture or a Latin American culture, whatever is the, the PC word of the week, um, I, you know, you're in when they start calling you loving nicknames based on attributes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know, and so like in America and in English, you're like with us, you'd never go to someone and say, Hey fatso, how are you doing? Uh -huh. Yeah. But you know, they go, Hey gordito, como estas? You uh -huh. know? And so, you know, I'm in, yep. I've got my little pet name, you know, that, that they're calling me based on an attribute. I'm in, I'm <laughs> in the group, you know? Um, so I learned that I learned, you know, you, in order to teach the people, you got to love the people. You know, in order to lead the people, you got to love the people. No one's going to follow you unless they know you love them. Yeah. You know, and no one's going to take any invitation. That's why it's love, share, invite, not invite, share, love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't love them if they accept your invitation. Right. You know, it's the other way around, yeah. you know. And so that's something I learned on my mission that, you know, has really helped me in my life, even outside of the church in business and in civic leadership. It's the same principle. Yep. Yeah. Gotta love people. So now in, in your role as on the high council and serving with the, the Spanish branch, uh, any s specific leadership principle or concept that comes to mind that served you well there? Yeah. So I've, I've only been there. I, this is my first year in that, in the role, but you know, I've taken a lot of what I learned as Ellis Quorum president and, and other opportunities. Um, as I sit and watch, you, you gotta go in humble. You know, you're there to love, share, and invite, not to dictate. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the other thing I've, you know, I've, I've learned the, the importance of observation, making yourself visible, um, which is a great business principle. You know, you're in, in business, if employees know you're always available, they'll come to you when they need you. And so I think that that's one thing I definitely learned in the Spanish branch by making sure that I'm there as many Sundays as I can be. Um, I'm building that relationship because they won't ask for my help unless they trust me. So first I needed, I knew when I went to Spanish branch and I already, I already knew some of the members um, because my daughter-in-law is from the Spanish branch. My son married a girl from oh, local cool. girl from the Spanish nice. branch. Um, and she's a legacy Spanish branch, grew up in the Spanish branch. So everybody knows the family. Um, and so, but I knew, even though I knew some people, I'm still the, the white English, you know, happened to speak Spanish because of his mission person coming into their yeah. unit. Right. And they are a family. Mm -hmm. You know, they have a different culture and a Latter-day Saint culture of activities and potlucks and that we don't necessarily have in our GB, Green Bay One Ward, mm -hmm. you know, where every month they're doing a dinner thing and they're getting together and making tacos and having a great time and rice and the whole, you know, having fun and socializing. <laughs> yeah. Christmas party, you know, yeah. we're very, you know, in the Green Bay First Ward, it's very traditional. Um, so I knew that I had to first um, make myself available and earn trust as I earn trust then opens opportunity and then you have to deliver. That's another key principle hmm. is if you say you're going to do something, you need to do it. You know, one of the things I'm working on right now is translation to make sure that every stake meeting 
has Spanish speaking translation. Yeah. That every document is translated in Spanish that we don't just take for granted mm -hmm. that they're going to throw it in Google Docs themselves. Right. You know, um, making sure they understand that even though we've always felt them a part of our, you know, actions speak louder than words. You can you can feel that you're a part of a unit a stake, but unless the units make you feel a part, you can be like an island unto yourself. Yeah. You know, in, in the Milwaukee mission, I believe there's only seven, seven or eight, I believe, areas for Spanish speaking missionaries. Wow. So they are, I mean, we have members in the Spanish branch here that drive an hour and a half or an hour 21 way to go to church. You know, yeah. and so that's dedication that they're here because they love the Lord and want to be here. Yeah. So how can I, as a high councilman, not get in their way? Yeah. Got to get out of the way. Right. And so that's one of the huge. things that I've learned in business is, you know, when I used to manage people, I used to like uh, I used to manage work for a company here in Green Bay that was the second largest health information management company. And so we digitize medical records and the whole nine. There's a whole mm -hmm. billion dollar business behind that. But um, uh, I managed a collections department. And I learned early in my management life that the job of a manager, your real job is just to move away obstacles from people so they can be successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not you. You're not doing anything. You know, you, you can't make the engine run. All you can do is spot things. Oh, let me fix that before it breaks. Or let me remove that obstacle so that that person can continue success. And so I liken that a lot to my job as a high councilman. My job is to help them know that there are resources. When their Relief Society president wants to speak with the state Relief Society president and counsel with them, I need to let I need to make sure that the third branch Relief Society president knows that I'm available to translate hmm. because that person doesn't speak Spanish. Yeah. Now we just have a brand new stake high councilman called for the stake uh, uh, young men's president speak Spanish. I'm super Perfect. excited for that. Yeah. You know, um, but it's, it's the whole thing of, you know, our Sunday school president from the stake when he wants to meet with, you know, uh, the stake or with, with Gene Bay first, our third, third branch um, uh, Sunday school president, make sure we facilitate that communication. Mm -hmm. Make sure that when the new, because the new videos just came out about, um, for Sunday school for teaching in the Savior's way. They have updated videos. So make I, I, try, I do my best to make sure that here's the Spanish versions. Yeah. You know, to make sure that they're... Because again, if you're, you know, people... It is very easy for people to feel not a part when we forget little things like a link in Spanish. Yeah, so true. Yeah. You know, and, and, and because of the culture of, of the Spanish speaking culture, it is, I mean... We sh we, we're at church. Everyone says hi to everyone. We shake hands. We hug. You know, I mean, it's it's full on love. You know, I mean, you're you you everyone knows that you are that they are happy that you're there. You know, that happens in the first ward as well. But with people I'm comfortable with. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, because you don't do that with everybody. For you sure. know? Right. It's yeah. just a different culture. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so it's very easy to make people feel like. Like if you, I, I just remember one time on a mission, I forgot to shake someone's hand as a missionary in the elders quorum. And you would have thought that I said something super offensive, <laughs> Yeah, but I just forgot to shake his hand that day, you know? And so that's kind of my, again, as I look at my, my job as a high councilman, it's to make sure that they are understand that there's resources available for them, that we're available, that I'm available specifically to them for any of their needs and um, not get in their way. Yeah. You know, because I think sometimes we have a tendency to think, oh, they're a small branch. They don't have the the resources. They don't have the longevity in the gospel. So how can they know how to run the gospel? Well, read the handbook. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. And I'm really passionate about that. Serving in, I served in Sacramento, Spanish okay. speaking. So nice. there's just those little things when you're in a English speaking stake, mm -hmm. the Spanish branch or ward can often be reminded that, oh, you're a, you're an other yes. because, oh yeah, we figured out about that. So there's just these little things that right. and you could do. And it's, you yeah. know, and, and people, and I always tell people, I don't, it's not that you're trying to offend. Yeah. It's not that you're not being Christ-like loving. It's just, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. 
So let's identify it. Let's move on. You know, yeah. sometimes when you bring it up, when you, you know, you don't want to sometimes like if I bring it up, are they going to feel like, you know, like one of the things I brought up recently is if at all possible, can we get talks in advance? Because it's so much easier to translate when a high councilman comes in for high council Sunday or at a state conference or a leadership training. If we have at least, you know, I understand people speak by the spirit, totally get it. Right. But typically they have some, some, some foundational scriptures that they're going to share. Yeah. Can we even just get that? Yeah. And so we've kind of worked on that now where we're getting better. I'm making sure uh, we're putting together a list of translators for the Spanish branch. Cause again, they could hear my voice. They could hear a missionary's voice, but it's so much more beautiful if it comes from a native Spanish speaking person. Yep. And we have several members in the Spanish branch ward or Spanish branch who speak good enough English mm -hmm. that they can listen or read and then just translate it naturally into their native language. And so that's really what we're working on. Um, Cause again, like you said, it's so easy and it's not meant to be that way, but it just happens. You know, typically most offense never is meant. It's just an, an oversight. Yeah. Yeah. Just an oversight. Just an sure. oversight. <laughs> Well, Ben, this has been fantastic just to learn about your own personal journey that's led to into some leadership and yep. um, really inspiring stuff. I'm excited to share this. So last question I have for you is as you reflect on your own personal journey through leadership, mm -hmm. how has being a leader helped you become a better follower of Jesus Christ? Ooh. Two things. Everyone always has a boss. There's always somebody, even if you own your own company there's whether it's regulations or something so learning that while you that that god is giving you this opportunity to shepherd his sheep um you know a phrase that my father taught me said to me years and years and years ago church is true gospel of jesus christ is true we're who god has to work with and so um taking that opportunity to um embrace the stewardship that heavenly father has given that has entrusted me to help his children. I've learned that that is not something to be taken lightly um, because in my patriarchal blessing, it says that um, it talks about how the mantle of leadership will be placed upon my shoulders and that many of our heavenly father's children will look to me for focus and guidance. So for many years, I thought that that was never going to happen. That part of my patriarchal blessing, because I was inactive mm. and I felt a loss. But again, Heavenly Father teaches me that as you obey, which is a very difficult principle for me in the beginning, because I think of it as a negative thing where I've learned that obedience is the key to happiness. As I learn to obey and I learn to accept opportunities and then I lean on the Savior and his teachings and Heavenly Father, any shortcomings I have, they will make stronger, which will then help me build my faith and testimony in Christ and the power of the atonement and help me want to follow them more while I help his children, my brothers and sisters on the covenant path back to our heavenly father. Cause we're all in different parts of that journey, but we're all trying to get to the same place. So any little part I can have in helping our heavenly father's children, through the gospel of Jesus Christ to help them return to him, I'm all in. And that concludes this How I Lead interview. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I would ask you, could you take a minute and drop this link in an email, on social media, in a text, wherever it makes the most sense, and share it with somebody who could relate to this, this experience. And this is how we how we develop as leaders, just hearing what the other guy's doing, trying some things out, testing, adjusting for your area. And uh, that's that's where great leadership's discovered, right? So we would love to have you uh, share this with uh, somebody in this calling or a related calling, and that would be great. And also, if you know somebody, uh, any type of leader, who would be a fantastic guest on the How I Lead segment, uh, reach out to us. Go to leadingsaints.org slash contact. Maybe send this in individual an email, letting them know that you're going to be suggesting their name for this interview. We'll reach out to them and uh, see if we can line them up. So again, go to leadingsaints.org slash contact, and there you can submit all the information and let us know. And maybe they will be on a future How I Lead segment on the Leading Saints podcast.
Remember to access the Questioning Saints Library for 14 days. Visit leadingsaints.org slash 14. It came as a result of the position of leadership which was imposed upon us by the God of heaven who brought forth a restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the declaration was made concerning the own and only true and living church upon the face of the earth, we were immediately put in a position of loneliness. The loneliness of leadership from which we cannot shrink nor run away and to which we must face up with boldness and courage and ability.